Live with Dr. Ian Holloman on our very first Master Supplements Masterclass. I mean, the company name lends so well to the whole idea. And if anyone here has seen the idea of Masterclass, you know, you can have Gordon Ramsay teaching you how to cook or Aaron Sorkin teaching you how to be a screenwriter. Today we have Dr. Ian Holloman, Dr. Autoimmune, which, you know, in an alternate universe, it sounds like you could be a Spider-Man villain who could give people spontaneous autoimmunity. So, you know, Dr. Autoimmune is actually here to help us in that context. And this, this masterclass is about education for education's sake. Yes, we're affiliated with master supplements in US enzymes, um, but I think there's a growing challenge nowadays with people being busy practitioners. They don't necessarily have as much time in a busy practice with their personal lives to learn as much as they would want on specific topics. And luckily we have such an incredible network of experts who are at the top of their field, excelling in what they do. And the whole idea of this is to allow them to shine in their genius and it's gonna be topic by topic. So this is gonna be the first of many. So Ian, I wanna thank you for being here today. Uh, how are you, my friend? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me, brother. Um, yeah, you know, the do whole Dr. Autoimmune thing, uh, that came as COVID came down and you know, a lot of us had to reinvent ourselves and that was, me as well and the staff was like and we just got to put a cape on you and i was like oh, look i gotta i gotta stop it at that point like i can't i'm not ready to take the cape on uh, i think you should bring the cape back it's an underutilized garment accessory <laughs> i mean i guess whatever works with the clients you know if they really think i'm superman um then then that's awesome but i am color coordinated because you know that's important so usually you know green undershirt with gray scrubs and then green scrubs with gray undershirt it's that's at least pretty critical to the healing process. There you go. Very serene. Green is a calming color, my friend. Well done. So Ian, I have a, a question that I want to kick this off with if, if I can. Yeah. I want to know your story from, you know, the inception point of your interest in health up until Dr. Autoimmune. Like, how do we get here? I want to give you a little personal expose to everyone here. Sweet, man. Um, yeah. So I, I love doing what I'm doing. And the, I think the first inspiration was my dad. He's a veterinarian. And so I grew up going, you know, to actually his grad school classes and sometimes class was, you know, doing a uh, cesarean on a, on a cow. And, and so, you know, that's a different kind of life experience than I think a lot of people have, but uh, it always kind of kept me interested in biology and even going through my undergrad, I knew I wanted to do pre-med, just didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and at some point I shadowed a chiropractor and I was like, this guy like touches people and they're so happy when they get off the table. Well, that led me down to the path of basically becoming a chiropractor. And then when I was in grad school, um, the, the, the crazy thing was, is that that's where I really developed my first chronic issue. Right. So I pretty much tanked in my ninth quarter. We call that the hell quarter. Um, and what that was, was our midterms and our entrance exams for student clinic. And then we also had national boards. Um, those were all happening at the same time. And then I also broke up with my girlfriend of four years. So it was basically a hot mess. And that's when I started developing symptoms, right? So as most of our clients have, you know, I started getting symptoms and it was everything from attention deficit to insomnia to, you know, um, blood sugar crashes, um, gut symptoms, terrible fatigue. And, um, and then I had this brain fog issue. It was like, oh, so bad. It was my head. It felt like my head was floating above itself. And so it was like, almost like it was detached, right? I had this like detached feeling. And the best way that I, that I can think about describing it is, is, is brain fog. Um, but that's how I described it to all these doctors that I started seeing, um, eight different ones, a couple, you know, student, student doctors that adjusted me and, and it, maybe it helped a little bit, but it didn't fix it. And so um, that's when on the ninth doctor, nine or 12 months later, uh, I found a functional medicine doctor. And he was like, hey, dude, here's what you got going on. Uh, you need to get your gut handled. You are highly reactive to, to gluten. And I'd heard about this before. I mean, I'd been taking muscle testing seminars and I heard about this concept, but I was like, not me. <laughs> I'm perfect. <laughs> right. 
this couldn't be me. And, and, and then, but I saw myself, I remember at one point I got, I got scared. Cause I was like, I, I, um, I failed a test. It was geriatrics and I failed the test. Right. And I was like, this is not me. This is, I'm like, usually the overachieving student, the type A, you know, kind of person. And uh, I saw myself really starting going downhill. So I got super serious about my diet. I, you know, started taking supplements, but I think the biggest part was um, I, I finally had found someone that had confidence and integrity and, and could back up what they were saying with labs. And, you know, and it was kind of like, oh, like, just fix me. Thank you. And his name was Dr. Scott. That was in California. So at that point, I was like, dude, I'm all in. Like I, and I started learning more about this functional medicine thing. And then I went after I graduated, started doing um, the whole like certification program through the Institute for Functional Medicine. So, so I graduated, right? Yes, I've got my, my, my super, super important, right? One of, a, one of a kind million piece of glass here. Um, so I graduated from the Institute for Functional Medicine, did my master's at the same time um, in human nutrition and functional medicine. And then I just decided that I wanted to focus on autoimmunity. I mean, I started seeing tons of thyroid patients and that was kind of crazy at first because I was like, what am I supposed to do with these people besides iodine and glandulars? <laughs> besides, you know, it's like iodine and adrenal, like, don't eat raw broccoli. No, yeah, raw broccoli. exactly. Cruciferous vegetables are terrible for you. And take this iodine, and um, you know, and here's some adrenal glandulars. And like, if that didn't work, it was like, uh, what do I do? I don't, I, I don't know. So that just, you know, and then I've just seen thousands of patients now, and I just got to the point where I was like, you know what? I want to. I actually had a clinic called Red Tail Wellness, and that was in operation for about twelve years. And as of so, last January is when I opened up. Um, not this last January, but the, the past was when I opened up Dr. Autoimmune. And so we're still seeing uh, other chronic conditions, interestingly enough, but I'm seeing a lot more percentage wise of autoimmune conditions. And I love it. Like, I mean, I'm sure for some people, autoimmunity probably drives them crazy. Um, and I had some really hard cases when I first started in um, down this path. And that's kind of why they call it practice, right? Because now I'm like looking back on it going, oof, like I missed some big things on those that cases. That is the single most important nugget of information I've heard in a while. I just kind of want to bring some awareness to that. You know, we hear these words practice and we just use that as a synonym for the fix or the process, but it really is a practice because in essence, autoimmunity is a simple concept. The body loses its ability to distinguish self from not self and collateral damage happens but knowing that it's such a complex myriad of, of scenarios why did you gravitate towards that what what about autoimmunity really grips you well so it, it, again part of its personal history right so my grandfather uh was someone that i always looked up to right and he was a uh, battle the bulge veteran purple heart right he was just always that the dude and um so I always looked up to him and he had celiac disease, right? Mm. And guess what? Turns out what I have. Well, I turned those genes on as well. So I have celiac disease too. Mm. So when I figured that out, you know, again, really going through the later part of my grad school, that's when it started to click to me that this could be something that I could pursue and really actually help people with. Um, I also saw, I think one of the things that really inspired me was actually Dr. Tom O'Brien. And he was kind of called the gluten doctor and he was lecturing all over the United States and went to one of his lectures. And I was like, wow, this guy's pretty awesome. Um, and then that got me further down the rabbit hole of functional medicine because it is, you know, it's, there's a lot of rabbit holes that you can go down as far as this stuff goes. But, you know, I think the younger doctors, if, if they can just, if they can really get good, at least in a, a one or two different areas, man, when you catch on fire, right? The old saying of you, you, you're going to burn and people are going to come watch you burn and they're going to hopefully get help as a result of that. That's, that's worked for me. And now that's true because it's personal. Like I, I know what it feels like to go through that experience. But what's also really cool is now that I've seen so many of the same patterns, like 
autoimmunity is complex. And if you read, like I bought a book on infectious diseases and autoimmunity, and this thing is like this thick, it's crazy, but there are very common patterns, right? The old saying of when you hear the sound of hoofbeats, you think horses instead of zebras. So there's very common patterns. And when you start to figure those out and you start to see those over and over again, it's not that hard. What's hard is convincing people that you can do this for them, right? It's, it's the, you know, exuding the confidence and showing them, hey, you might've been beat up by X, Y, Z practitioners and they didn't really do a great job with you. But if you trust me on this one, I can take you down that path. And that's what I love doing. It's a beautiful insight. I mean, you said something that's kind of a very closely coupled term with autoimmunity. You said burning because there's in a negative context, there's a lot of inflammation here. And you mentioned young doctors getting really good at framing things or understanding how to really excel at one or two things. When you're teaching someone who may be a client or a clinician about autoimmunity, what are your first principles in terms of looking at it? Because we have the mechanisms, we have the theoretical, and then we have the scenario where the client's in front of you and you have to make decisions for that person's benefit. Where do right. you start? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of similar, actually, if I was, if I was doing it, whether it be a clinician or, or a patient. It's, it's really telling them, first of all, it's always giving hope. You know, I call it vi vitamin H. And, and the first hope is that your body wants to heal itself. It, it always has the ability to. And if, it, and if it's led in that direction, it's always going to go in that direction. But secondly, it's understanding that every single autoimmune condition, there's technically 80 classified, but there's probably maybe 106, 107 that we know about that aren't official, but really they all share three things, genes, environments, and triggers. And so, you know, if I'm saying, hey, look, Mrs. Smith, you've got this thing called Hashimoto's, right? Which is an autoimmune thyroid issue, one of the most common autoimmune conditions out there. You know, your docs just ran a TSH they didn't quite figure you out. They might've put you on a thyroid medication, but check it out. What you really got going on is an immune disorder. Your immune system, it fights infections and does things like that, right? Keeps you healthy. But what it also does is it, it is regulated. And that regulation, if you lose that as a result of different genetic predispositions, environmental factors, and triggering events or triggers, then you get this kind of super, I'm looking at your backdrop. So I'm like, it's like a supernova, right? So it's like, yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's everything kind of comes together in this, this unfortunate mix. And then you turn on those genes, Mrs. Smith. And what's happening now as a result of that, it's not your thyroid's fault. It's a fact that your immune system has turned your thyroid into the redheaded stepchild. And it's now targeting that tissue when it really shouldn't by the way i'm not pc at all so um <laughs> so this will be fun um but um but, and i'm in boulder too so um you know <laughs> we have a You're saying high enough that no one can get you it's fine. well we have a saying in boulder that you know well at least i do it's you know that we're so far to the left that we're coming up the right uh, so it's <laughs> i told you we we're gonna have fun tonight um but but if i can get people to understand that if we can remove the triggers, figure out if there's any environmental issues going on, including obviously really which manifests, manifest, manifests itself as leaky gut, right? Because again, there's this guy, his name is Alicio Fasano. He figured out celiac disease and he basically said, hey, for you to have not just celiac disease, but any autoimmune disease, right? you have to have intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And that's, that's a bold statement, right? But basically, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I can, I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Yeah, I, just, I just wanna show like one, I, don't, I may show like two slides this entire time. Yeah, everyone um, loves visual representations. Yeah, so this, can you see that? Yep. So, you know, and if we do, we could, well, I'm not going to hit play, but anyways, just if we go in here, right? So this is Fasano talking um, in a, you know, he's published all over the place, but he's basically saying that the role of intestinal barrier function is the gateway into gastrointestinal autoimmune diseases. But he goes on and says, like, right, and 
for this one is specific to GI issues, but it's been said now all over peer reviewed research, whether it be Hashimoto's, whether it be rheumatoid, whether it be scleroderma, Sjogren's, you know, cholangiectitis, all these different kinds of autoimmune related phenomena is a process where that barrier starts to break down. Right. And that, and that, again, that doesn't mean that we just need to give people glutamine and, you know, a probiotic um, and maybe some vitamin D and we call it good. Like that's an oversimplification of what's going on. Now, here's the thing. Could that work? Absolutely. But you, you would need to check labs. You need to actually look at people's symptoms, look at their labs, figure out if that's what's actually the mechanism here. Right. Because I think a lot of clinicians will, will be like, oh, you're autoimmune. You just need vitamin D. And I go, well, that's great. You know, uh, immune regulatory hormone critical. I mean, we could talk all hour just about vitamin D and how amazing it is because it's a hormone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's those, it's a Goldilocks hormone. So it's got to be optimized, but although it helps to keep those cells nice and tight in the gut, there's more than just vitamin D at play here. And so this basically is just Fasano saying, Hey, look, this autoimmune process can be arrested or it can be actually stopped if you get into this, this, um, this area where genes and environmental triggers is really prevented or treated by reestablishing barrier function. So that's, that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to show is that, you know, I can talk the talk, but sometimes people go, well, what about the research behind that? I'm like, call it leaky gut or call it intestinal permeability. I don't really care but it exists. As of right now, there's just no drugs that treat it. <laughs> no. It's very hard to target that because what mechanism are you going to target? As you said, yep. you can't oversimplify things. You know, in the context of supplements, they are tools. And if you give someone a hammer and just tell them to start swinging, that could go really badly if you're not careful. Yep. Uh, what you said there is really awesome because we've done a, a six month expose of looking at the interconnectedness of the body through the lens of the GI system. Mm. And you see that there is nothing that is a condition of compromise that is not a, a conscious decision by the body, meaning the body is resulting in this symptom manifestation is the best way of holding itself together while it tries to offset the problem. So if you're trying to treat the thyroid and you have you know, some poison leaking into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system, the thyroid is a sacrificial lamb and that's where Mm -hmm. the lack of compensation runs out it's at that organ or it could be anywhere else as you mentioned a list of other diseases when it comes to your clinic what are you seeing the most of as a condition um wow well, good question you know i would say probably number one is hashimoto's um autoimmune disease and so we're gonna see oof i don't know probably 20 30 percent of what my practice is is either undiagnosed um autoimmune thyroid or people that have some kind of thyroid condition, but they just haven't figured out the triggers. It's interesting because 10 years ago, it was probably much more actually thyroid related. I used to do thyroid lectures and, and, and I may get back into that a little bit as now obviously things are opening up and, um, and the world is not ending uh, supposedly right for right now anyways. Um, and so, but you know, 10 years ago, it was like, no one knew what, what that hypothyroidism was mainly again, Hashimoto's and mainly it was an autoimmune condition. Um, so that was, I think, you know, a low hanging fruit for a lot of, lot of people. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm seeing is quite a bit of uh, mixed connective tissue disease um, and or diseases. I'm seeing uh, a lot of rheumatologic related issues, you know, not just RA, um, other ones out there and we call them seronegative, seropositives. There's different kinds of, of, of those out there. Um, I, I'm, I'm just seeing a lot of, of the, the chronically ill and the people that, that are suspecting that they're autoimmune, but they're not quite sure, or their doctor thinks they have autoimmune issues or their symptoms seem to be like autoimmune. So, you know, then they go out there and they Google it and they go, oh, well, well is this autoimmune? Is this not? And, and I think for the most part, people are just still really confused because no one is taking the time to sit them down and say, hey, here's a labs we ran here's how we're diagnosing this, or we're calling this a, maybe an autoimmune phenomenon. Um, and the bottom line is, is that if your labs are tracking, if your symptoms are getting better, uh, call it whatever you want it, but you've got your life back. Mm. Cause I don't care. I mean, yeah, it was cool to see labs shift. And I, I love that from my left brain, you know, kind of perspective. 
but numbers going back on those reference ranges. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's fun. I love, do, I love shooting. It makes me look like a wizard, you know, when I'm doing that with blood chemistry. Uh, but it's cool when someone is, has, you know, 20 pounds of water weight, like in their face, <laughs> right. Or, or their body and they feel awful and they're fatigued and they come in, they're just like floating. And I remember like last week I was talking, uh, I was a gal, she had, um, that thyroid, uh, she had fibromyalgia. She had a couple other things going on too. And she lost, like, it was about five months or so that I've been working with her. She's lost 60 pounds. She is not in chronic pain anymore. Um, she's tapered off of half of her medications. Um, and, and, and so there's all these things happening. Right. And I just, when she came in and she's smiling and I'm like, you know, you're smiling right now. She's like, yes. I'm like, do you remember how bad things were? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Like that's, that's where I can actually say, okay, I think I've made a difference. <laughs> I would say so. I mean, other than the fatigue and her facial muscles from probably not doing that for a while, you know, that's probably <laughs> the only challenge in that scenario. It's beautiful. You know, in all of those conditions, people do struggle a lot to find answers. And when you're throwing, you know, anti-inflammatory agents and immune suppressors, and that doesn't work, mm -hmm. it really becomes about being the Sherlock Holmes. And, and in all those conditions, you know, other than leaky gut, which we can agree upon is likely an initiating factor that's common among all these things. Are there any other commonalities among the different autoimmune conditions you see, be it presentation of certain symptoms that are peripheral, mm -hmm fatigue, weight gain, lethargy, inflammation, and pain in the joints, or anything in the blood labs that are really interesting values that you're tracking and noticing as a pattern? Right. Well, I mean, you know, to take kind of, again, one of those step backs, step back and, and, and just say, okay, well, what else is an autoimmune condition? Well, it's really, it's a mitochondrial disorder, right? And so we can get kind of pretty deep into the weeds pretty fast. We start talking about electron transport train and you know, well, let's say it's an energy problem because the first yeah. lecture we did this year was everything is energy. So all conditions have a mitochondrial component and an energy problem. Exactly. And that's where I was going is basically that, that the vast majority of people are going to be fatigued right now. The interesting thing is that their COVID really pulled the mass back uh, um, on how bad blood sugar handling is, is in this country, right? especially when it comes to insulin resistance. It's going to be one of the most common things that I'm seeing in the practice. And really, I mean, you can, you can diagnose it without any kind of lab. If you got fatigue after meals, if you've got sugar cravings after meals, and or sometimes what's going to happen is people are hypoglycemic, but then it's turning into insulin resistance, right? The shakiness or irritability, lightheadedness, lightheadedness in between meals or that, you know, getting hangry. Um, all of those blood sugar handling issues are essentially going to decrease the efficiency of how glucose is utilized. So therefore you're going to have fatigue as a result of that. Now, some of that's carbohydrate intolerance, right? And some, some, sometimes it's just a dietary intervention of getting in there and shifting that, but sometimes it's also an inflammatory component. Meaning, for example, if you've got insulin resistance, that really may actually be coming as a result of wheat sensitivity or gluten sensitivity, right? And then we also know, again, if someone's gluten sensitive, that's gonna be one of the most common triggers that relates to autoimmune disease, because again, it's all manifesting the gut, it's creating that permeability issue. Mm -hmm. So the common things, right? Probably the two most common things that I see in the office right now, and, and it doesn't matter what condition is, right? It doesn't matter what, that's the beauty behind autoimmunity is that I don't, I mean, I've rem you, were, you start to remember certain things about certain conditions, right? But you don't have to do all that. You just got to figure out how to make sure that you deal with the triggers per the person in front of you, and then they start to get better. So if you get them on the right diet, which, you know, some people need AIP, some people just need a basic paleo, some people just need to cut out the crap in the diet. But what's hard is it's very, very challenging for people to get away from the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the lifestyle is what really kills people. And, and if you're, it, for me, half of what I'm doing is talking to them about their behavior about, Hey man, like last week talking to a guy, he has, he had, th he has three autoimmune conditions. I diagnosed two. So I diagnosed pernicious and Hashimoto's and he has, he's, and he has, um, 
Sjogren's, right? So he has this, his, all his lymph nodes were all flared up and he goes to the doctor. And anyways, so now he's got three. He's been on the program for two months doing phenomenal, right? Blood sugar levels are stable. He was type two diabetic when he came in. So now he goes out and he sees Tom Cruise, right? In Top Gun. And he's, in, in a, cause I, I'm like, like what's going on? And his name's Tom. And so I'm like, what's up, Tom? He's like, you know, I'm doing okay, but man, like I just started feeling really funky. Like I'm kind of getting a little more tired. And then um, I just started kind of feeling really off. And that was Sunday. And I was like, what'd you do Friday or Saturday? And he goes, well, I went and saw the, um, you know, the new Tom Cruise movie. I was like, oh, cool. How was it? Blah, blah, blah. Right. And I'm like, what did you have? He goes, well, I have two Michelobes. Ah. <laughs> so I'm like, bro, you, do, you, do you understand that there's a delay? It's not typically, most people don't have immediate symptoms when they consume the dietary antigen. No, that's usually a true allergy, which is EpiPen styles right there. And that's, that's not yeah. the same thing. It's a delayed response sensitivity. Yep. So IgE right mechanism versus an IgG versus a delayed response, or there's other things, you know, even delayed responses that are not IgG. But the point is, is that he is not connecting his behavior that's triggering the autoimmunity. And, you know, and again, that's why I have a nutritionist, but some people it's kind of like, psh, psh, like when you consume that, you're going to have months of inflammation. And, and literally what I told him was something that I heard. I remember um, the T's Karazi and saying this once. And he was like, well, uh, you know, you ate gluten and you lost some of your thyroid tissue. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, just like smug and like matter of fact, like that. And I said, <laughs> <words. laughs> you know, no big deal. You just lost some thyroid tissue. You have <laughs> atrial. Yeah. yeah. He just lost, you know, some ability to absorb his B12. Um, and now he flared up his, his, uh, his glands again. No. except for that obviously when you flare things up you lose that tissue potentially permanently there's a point to where it does not regenerate you know you know i can echo a challenge where i have uh there's a an athlete i work with and his big thing is family pizza nights in the summer mm -hmm. and he's struggling with a condition so you know it's 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 sometimes telling people look i know that this is a really important thing to you and there's a degree to where it's like you know, if you eat that in the company of loved ones in an amazing environment, there's there's some degree of offset probably that can be accounted for versus, you know, crushing a box of pizza by yourself, binging on Netflix in the dark room. But let's say I'm a young clinician, perfect right? Storm. There you go. That's a perfect storm. No, I had the beer and some donuts afterwards, but I'm right. a young clinician, right? And I want to get into autoimmunity. That's a perfect example of a patient challenge. How do yep. you communicate the lifestyle? What are the things that your patients struggle with the most to the execution side? Because the best laid plans go to waste when they're not yep. executed. Yep. Well, so, um, you know, I figured this one out with the help of uh, a mentor. And he basically said, hey, Ian, you know, you're working with chronic illness now. If you really want to get good with these clients, you got to get their spouses to show up. Because guess who? where most of that external pressure is coming from for them not to adhere to their diet. The one who doesn't want them to change. Exactly. Totally. hundred percent. Don't leave me behind, honey, because we're in our dysfunctional state. Right. And we can just be, you know, somewhat happy here as we eat the pizza. Um, and, and so, and, you know, again, it's usually the female who's you're seeing, again, 80% of my clientele are, are women. God and bless. Is that because just to add, is there something within the, the female genome that is more susceptible to, because I most more autoimmune conditions are on the female side. There's something there, isn't it? Yeah. So it, on average, right, for every three to four women who have an autoimmune issue, one guy has the same autoimmune issue, right? So it's, it's 5%, a, it's, 75 split. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and it, it can differ a little bit depending on what condition we're talking about. <clears throat> Thyroid is going to be higher. There's some other ones that are lower. There's a mix of that, but just if you kind of look at them all across the board. So one of the things, right, is that females obviously carry a higher burden because of those reproductive organs. They're also dealing with issues like fibroids, like endometriosis, like PCOS, all things that can essentially skew hormones 
mm-hmm. and then obviously lead it towards that being in and of itself its own trigger. Mm-hmm. And so it's so important that like, for example, when you're looking at blood work and, and someone has low ferritin, you're saying, well, they have an iron deficiency anemia, which means obviously they've got some mitochondrial problem. They, they're going to have fatigue, but is that coming from the gut or is that like, for example, a fibroid issue that's stealing iron? So like those, those little things, right? Like, <clears throat> and I guess that's kind of how my brain works a little bit is like, if it's not this, it's, it's probably more likely this. Yeah, and I think that, it, exactly. And, and that's, and maybe that's just, I'm sure there's lots of people that do that. Right. I'm sure Elon is like next level as far as well, Elon's got a mind map that has its own mind map. So, so, um, but, <clears throat> but, you know, with, with that situation, the, the lead for me is going to be, Hey, you may have all these other issues, but we're still going to fix blood sugar, which can then trigger hormone issues. And we're still then going to also figure, uh, uh, we're going to figure out your gut as well. And sometimes blood sugar has to be done before the gut is handled. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's where, again, another mistake that I made was trying to launch into these complicated, you know, AIP style diets. <clears throat> and then the patient is hypoglycemic. And I, and, and that's just, it's a, it's a hot mess waiting to happen. 10 grams of carbs. I wish you luck. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, you know, again, we can give them fruit, but eventually what happens is, is, you know, two, three, four weeks in, they hit this big, big wall <clears throat> and there's not enough collagen out there that's going to help stabilize their blood sugar enough. And so then they revert back to the same dietary patterns, which is also the flaring their autoimmune condition up. So again, you know, if you can just get people 30 days into this, most clients feel way better, right? And yes, yeah, some people, you know, like women, they, they, they will need to get estrogen dominance issues handled. They will need to, if they're, you know, if their pellet of testosterone is way too high and then they have a blood sugar issue, now they're aromatizing that into estrogen, you know, like there's, there's different complications going on because it can, a lot, everyone brings their baggage. You know what I mean? It's like, I went to the hormone doctor. Guess what they gave me? <laughs> oh God. What, what could that be? I don't know. Like you work with athletes. It's like, how could we make you better? Let's give you twice as much testosterone. That's going to fix oh, everything. athletes. Don't do that. No, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but this is written. And, and this is what I love about this conversation. It shows you the depth of the challenge of the individual. And I think the most important thing you said there in all of that is, Let's say you're, you're a woman who's wanting to fix her autoimmune condition. You have a recalcitrant husband who eats nothing but meat and potato diet. You're yeah. not going to have any support. Yes, it's you. Exactly, the big circle back to that. So, so I require right that that spouse, they come in. And this sometimes creates a little bit of conflict between the me and the patient. And I have to have that, like, you know, we, I see like a patient that I had today and she's trying to divorce her husband. I'm not going to have him come into the report of findings. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to support her wholeheartedly as far as her, in that process, whether she's going to heal that relationship or not, but obviously it takes two to tango now, but when it comes to, Hey, look, we've got this case. It's going to take lifestyle intervention. Who's going to support you. Who's going to, you know, hinder you. That person needs to be involved in making the, the, the decision, not for them, but I need to call them on the carpet. I need to ask them, are you okay with her making, or if she's the one that's making the, the, the meal, are you okay if you're eating the food that, that she's going to eat? And it's like, well, what is that? Lean protein, vegetables, fruit. Can you handle that? Well, uh, this, and I'm like, okay. And are you okay with keeping the bread and the pasta and the things out right now? Because again, the reality, so it's so hard for us. And, and I don't want to make excuse for, excuses here, but it is challenging when you're in a situation where you've got kids, you got to feed them. You came home from work. You've also got a hungry spouse. People are snacking on foods. You want to be snacking on that. And then you have to prepare a salad and a steak or whatever it is, right? Like that's, that's the reality of what our, we have to put ourselves in people's shoes of like, Hey, what does this look like when, you go home and you got to execute this diet. 
So I, I think having them on board has, has been a big game changer for me. And that's how I explain it to clients because people can get really defensive about it. Like, well, you know, I make my own money decisions. And I'm like, I never said anything about money. <laughs> Reason why we're having, you know, Donald here is I want to know that he's willing to support you. Oh, he's willing to support me. Well, I've never met Donald. So you're telling me that, that, he's going to one support this financially Two, he's going to understand why you're making these changes. And three, um, he is a hundred percent behind every decision that you're making right now. And most of the time it's no, like they're questioning They're They're wondering why you're going to an alternative practitioner. They're wondering why you're not getting this covered by the healthcare insurance model. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of barriers. That, a lot that, of people want to have their suffering in silence. They're embarrassed about their condition, right? It's, it's like, true. You know, or they you mentioned something. I remember when I used to teach at a nutrition school, uh, I gave my students this thing called the five day miracle diet. There was this very rigid way of eating. Like in the morning, you could only have like a this and a that. You had to have like a hard food at 11 o'clock lunch, a soft food at three and everyone bitch and whined. Like, this is so stupid. I like my morning chia pudding. I like my smoothie. Everyone was complaining. Like, guys, stop complaining. Just get to the end. You'll see the purpose of it. Five days, they're all bitching and whining. And I said, now you know how a client feels that you've given your idealistic little plan to. Yeah. Your entire world has changed. And yeah. you've come up with this idealistic, beautiful vision. And they go, what's quinoa? <laughs> uh, right. Qu right? Quinoa. Quinoa. Oh, man, I've been getting that <laughs> the whole time i gotta put another <laughs> we, we know uh, so so yeah so like and that's and that's hard because you know on the fly as a clinician you gotta you gotta make that decision right of like mm -hmm. hey this person's aip maybe this person's paleo maybe we're just gonna focus on you know eliminating some of the more inflammatory foods your grains and your alcohol and your caffeine etc um you know and what's gonna be the best for that person and and you don't really know but you know, it's also then related to that, that motivation, right? Like what's that? I always talk to people in that initial consult, like, Hey, what motivates you? And people are taken aback by that question. They're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, why do you want more energy? Because you said you're fatigued. And it's like, it makes, you know, it makes people think to be like, wait, why am I here in this doctor's office? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting him for what? <laughs> Yeah, but why why am I paying why am I gonna pay this guy thousands of dollars basically to 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 take very, very good question because it also lets you know how bought in they are. If they haven't even thought about it, it allows you to maybe backtrack as a clinician because you know I asked about what challenges the patients experience, but you know, on the other side of it, what's your biggest challenge? Because there's this I need to know my mechanisms, I need to know why something is stealing ferritin. Is it a viral thing? Is it a fibroid thing, as you said, which we can dig into a little bit later? But how much of your challenge is not figuring out the mechanisms of action below the surface and actually knowing how to deal with the person and the personality? Because in my world, I have the physical, I have the mental, I have the psycho-emotional, I have the spiritual aspect of that person. That's mm -hmm. the complete being to me. Yeah. And when I was young and excited and full of piss and vinegar, I thought I knew how to just do everything physically. But you start to realize the more people you work with. It's really about knowing how to work with the person. And I think that's probably the, the insight that I'd love to tease out for you as a, a successful clinician. What are your biggest challenges? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be at least 80%, right? That, that you're, you're working with a human being. And ultimately, there's, there's always going to be the interplay between good cop and bad cop. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I look at it, is that I am trying to create uh, positive reinforcement, right? I'm trying to operantly condition my client because they need to be rewarded in a positive way to show that, hey, look, when you don't eat this, what do you get? More energy. Okay, great. Or you don't get explosive diarrhea. Fantastic. Great, ca great cause and effect, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's also like that behavioral aspect, like we were just talking about of like, you know, restriction and withdrawal and, you know, dealing with people in my patient population who quite often had uh, previous eating disorders. And, you know, are we going to make them worse as a result of making these different recommendations? And, and, you know, I, I decided early on, you know, well, I mean, maybe about eight or nine years ago, I think I've been practicing for 13, it'll be 14 in October, um, or sorry, 13 in October. 
Um, but I decided that I wanted to hire a nutritionist, you know, and that was just my thing. But I quickly, the, the nutritionist position also became probably 50, 50 of here, here's emotional support. Therapist, <laughs> and, nutritionist. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'd, I'd have to have that conversation with, with my nutritionist of like, Hey, you know, you went over again <laughs> with your time because you opened up that can of worms and that's great. But if you don't have the training on that and you're now starting to talk about, you know, childhood trauma and this was supposed to be a nutrition visit, like, I guess it's very, very relevant what you're talking about, but make sure you're not just staying in your lane, but you're being very comfortable about guiding people through that process because there's always, there's ramifications of as you unpack that. And, and, and that for me is where I was like, look, I'm going to use neural feedback in my practice because it's fantastic for with subconscious issues. Um, I'm going to refer if I need to, if I see there's a, like mental health issues going on, it's okay to have a team, right? I think it's essential to have that interconnected practitioner network. Yeah. This is where we can all work together and shift things rather than debate whose methodologies are better or what's superior when you're comparing an apple and an orange. It's, it's yeah. irrelevant. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, it's like, look, you know, get a good lab company that you trust and you understand, you know, get supplements that you, you trust and you understand, um, you know, find the people that you work well with, right? Um, and then make sure you're tracking their progress, right? Which is a huge one too, because psychologically, when people start to see that you are backing up your talk with the walk, and they're starting to see it in their own life, right? That That's huge for them, because then they, I mean, it, always, it still blows my mind. I'm like, I'm like, you're feeling so much better, but still people don't quite believe it. And they're still kind of like on that edge of like, maybe I'm going to go back to my old lifestyle. And then you show them their labs and be like, no, no, no. Look what happened to your TSH. Look what happened to your thyroid antibodies. Look what happened to your insulin. Like, like, and this is how this is relating to what's going on. You start to, you know, stack those things together. And then all of a sudden you go, whoa, this is fun. Like it's fun to come in and fix people. And, and that's what we all get into this, right? It's that joy of, hey, look, man, like I can help people feel better and then they can, and they'll pay me, right? Usually, and then throwing an insurance model and there's nothing wrong with that, but it is what it is. I, I work in a cash model and I just like that because I, I'm results oriented. I'm, I'm always under pressure. Mm -hmm. And that's always if they are a willing participant. Which is the other half, more important half of that equation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. You can have all the finances you want in the world. You can throw all this stuff at it. You can hire all the personal chefs that you want. But if you're not doing the work, you don't, and in the end, you probably don't want it enough at that point. You know what I mean? And, and sometimes it does come into, hey, wow, actually, I didn't realize that, you know, that little cheat here and there was a big deal. Or, hmm, you know what? I really do have to evaluate my relationships because they might be toxic, right? Or, um, you know, like me, I knew something had been going on recently with my health and I wasn't quite sure what's going on. Well, speaking of wells, um, I said, you know what, maybe I should check my, my, myself for heavy metals. And I did that. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to quickly share this with you. Oh, we're getting a little personal here. Yeah, no. Yeah. But well, I just was having some brain fog issues. Right. I and I was I was like, what's going on? My energy was kind of just a little bit off. Russian brown rice protein all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll do college. You live in a power plant up in Boulder, uranium. <laughs> so uranium is in our water supply, unfortunately. Um, That's and why I, you grow. Yep. And I'm, I'm in a, uh, I have a well. I've actually been living in, on wells for 12 years now. Um, so I've got a water test that's going to be done here pretty soon. I got, um, you know, shout out to water check. Um, and, uh, they're great sources as far as for, for checking water sources, but you know, there's actually people have been, uh, tested even a local water supplier here in Boulder and they've actually come back and shown positive, um, uranium sources coming from actually a commercial product. So anyways, you know, we were just chatting earlier before we started, but I'm like, I just started my own detox program. Um, so for as I'm upping my enzymes, systemic enzymes, I'll probably do, um, you know, more, you know, you're probably, I don't know, we'll, we'll see what, which one I do, but, but, well, you know, youth design may want to come in handy to, to deal yeah. with that acute inflammatory response yep. of what happens if one of those guys goes rogue. 
might, might do that. And then, you know, I'm always going to use fiber and the sun fiber is always amazing as a binder, but it's also just, you know, for me, like when we always kind of get into protocols, which is another rabbit hole, but I do actually start the majority of my clients on um, a methylated B vitamin complex. Um, mm -hmm. I put them on hydrochloric acid. Um, I put them on sun fiber, right? Just as a good pre -bi I mean, when I've run so many stool tests and I, it's crazy because um, about 80% of my clients have low beneficial flora. And we're talking about like most likely the most important thing that regulates or stimulates T regulatory cells, right? And so, so just so important. And then if there is high levels of inflammation or autoimmune activity going on, I use immunozyme as well, mm -hmm. right? And so that's just, again, the, it, and it's really, it is a convenience item because- It's you know, your formulation, it's your baby, you know, which is a really yeah. cool thing. But yeah. I want to get something if we can. You mentioned supplements, protocols, rabbit hole. There's something that I'm seeing that's happening in the industry, and I'd love your take on this, just your thought process and your philosophy. So many practitioners nowadays, because I think there's this rush to get into practice. So it's like you rush to get your piece of paper, in your case, your glass paperweight, um, not taking anything away from you. But you know, it, it's we're so focused on that, but the value of knowledge and thinking seems to be less prioritized. Mm -hmm. When I design a protocol, it is to the person. Like when someone asks me, what's the gut protocol? Like, I don't know. For whom? For what? What's the protocol for this? And that part of my language, that shit's driving me crazy sometimes. And I really want to kind of call out some practitioners as a group is saying, guys, we all need to get back to the beauty of critical thinking because uh -huh. the best protocol is the one that works. And it's well, the one for the person after you know what you're dealing with. You don't go, oh, I have an autoimmune thyroid client. I'm just going to throw the autoimmune thyroid protocol at them because that's like we talked about in the beginning, the vitamin D, the glutamine, and the iodine, and see you later. So yeah. how do you go about creating protocols? Well, okay, so there's a good and a bad, right? Because when you start, le when you start learning this, you know, it is obviously the easy route to go the protocol list. And, and we can say maybe it's a good jumping off point. Sure. And, it's and not valueless. No, it's not. And and there are some, I think there's really good practitioners out there that have developed some of this. Again, you know, the main reason why I, I formulated this was because I was tired of putting people on five different products. You know, all the stuff that upregulates these, these T cells to do their job again was taking me five products. And then I start people off on five products and it'd be like, whoa, right out of the gate. We already got you on like eight to 10 products and pill fatigue sets in pretty quick. You sound like a human Morocco coming around the corner. <laughs> at least at mealtime, right? So, yeah. so, so I think it's, it's not a bad idea as far as a, a stepping off point, but, but this is an art form, right? It's an art form and that we are, if we're truly saying what functional medicine is, is the customization to what people need, then not everyone needs vitamin D. Okay. Not everyone is going to need, um, you know, a probiotic. Not everyone is going to need um, the enzyme, right? Now there's potentially benefit by all those things. And there's a low potential of side effects, but it also comes back into the dollars and cents plus what you're going to fatigue people out on. And then also what's you're going to get your, how fast of a response you're going to get, which is obviously what we're trying to do with people. So, you know, for me, I think when you start to get really comfortable in the realm of what you're good at working on, then you start to realize many times less is more and getting into the basics of what that first root cause issue is, be it gut, be it blood sugar, be it, you know, adrenal, be it whatever stress handling, then focusing on that and then figuring out what your outcomes are can, can get you away from the protocol. Because then at that point, you, you know, if you're looking at blood work or if you're looking at a heart rate variability or, you know, you're, whatever it is, you can go in there usually even within weeks and you're going to see a difference and then, or you're not <laughs> right. And, and the protocol and then, like, is gone by the wayside and now you got to go back to square one. Exactly. And what, what obviously is, is not good is, I mean, one, you've got really one opportunity to make an impact on a patient. And you, we all learn this as clinicians the hard way. We've 
if you haven't failed on clients, I mean, what are you doing? Like you're go It's like, again, it's part of that practice thing. Like it ain't nothing perfect in what we're doing in our industry. And it's certainly not for the Western medicine approach either. Right. Um, I mean, the stakes are obviously much higher for acute medicine, but you know, it's like, you know, it sucks when your patient dies. Um, but when we're talking about chronic, which is where most of we're, we're at, it's like you very often are going to burn that trust if you're not getting that incremental and sustained improvement. And that's why your first foot out of the gate, I don't think needs to be, it shouldn't be a protocol. It should be, hey, look, we identified the top level issues. Here's your behavioral problems that we're seeing that are contributing to that. Do you want to own those issues? Right. Is that, you know, and like for a lot of times, sometimes for me, that's a yes or a no. Like I ask people and that's where I'm playing bad cop where I'm like, you know, are you ready, willing, and able to change your diet? Are you, if the test comes back positive, are you willing to, are you willing to stop eating, you know, gluten? A lot of times I look at the spouse. Do you believe that? And so like, I'm not turning into the counselor here, but at the same time is I'm trying to figure out if what I'm going to do is working. Mm -hmm. Like I want to, I want to predict the future, right? Professionals predict the future. So if I have the best protocol in the world, but if I don't have a willing patient, mm, well, they might buy those supplements, but they may never come back. <laughs> and that may be only 10% of what resolves their problem. You know, the supplement protocol may be a small fraction. And, and I think the word protocol has to be understood and expanded because the protocol is the entire combination of variables that you're shifting yeah. that can probably be applied to the saying. It's like, you can't get well in the same environment that got you sick. True. So the adaptability of like, behaviors the lifestyle aspects the dietary activity sleep you know all those things they're so powerful and the supplement protocol is it's in the name it's a supplement right and these things are very powerful when you become strategic but i i think you'd agree with me in saying that the only way to know how to devise a good supplement protocol is to really get familiar with the mechanisms of action of what's going on based yep. upon yep. what the body's trying to do to keep itself together yeah, exactly. And which again, goes back to just, we're all unique. You know, if we want to show people, well, Hey, look, well, what are all the things that stimulates these, these T regs? Well, again, you're, you're talking about alpha lipoic acid, right? So could be used for blood sugar, but then on the other hand, alpha lipoic acid, if you're taking too high of a dosage for too long of a period of time, can start to downregulate the thyroid ability. So you have to be careful about that, right? We, D3, it's fantastic, but D3 can suppress the immune system if you're shooting way above, you know, 80, 90, 100. That's so right. now K2, it can be a nightmare for the calcium deposits in your arteries. Like totally. Like sword. Exactly. So you got your K. Okay. Well, again, some of that can come from green leafies if you're absorbing and digesting. Right. Um, but there's also vitamin A. Well, look, you know, again, you get into to women who are of childbearing age, you can't, they have to understand that there is some research out there that shows that there's potentially a teratogenic effect of vitamin A, meaning if you're going to hit them with a retinoic acid dose, similar to Accutane, then they can't get pregnant, right? Because Accutane has side effects. So it's the same thing. It's derived from vitamin A, but it's also incredibly potent as a way to stimulate these Treg cells, right? Fiber, you can also get that from the diet, but Again, the reality there can is be that, negative fibers like inulin, which I call a fart bomb, can be one of the worst things. And people, oh, fibers, fibers, yeah. fibers. I know. Like stud fiber is like, oh my God, it's amazing when like people have had the experience of what inulin is, is like. And, and if you don't start really slow, right, on on uh, your your chicory and, and, and products, then you're gonna have you're gonna have issues. Uh, issues in the tissue. <laughs> probiotics are great, right? So again, the three probiotics that, that I put in the product are specific to interleukin 10 right? Especially that BLO4. Um, and there's other ways to get that, but it's, it's, it is strain specific, but there's also cultured foods that you can get and you can encourage that. It kind of just depends. I mean, you know, the, the, the bummer, the downside of probiotics is they're a little bit on the, on the pricier side. The upside is that you can get like pretty awesome clinical benefits. So, you know, a lot of times we trust your company and that they source the proper strains that yeah. are 
specifically designated so you know their functionalities and mechanisms well about. yeah and then you get into like sodium alginate you know again they have like their own delivery system and like all the cool mm-hmm. bells and whistles and like i mean then you can really start to do amazing things something that's 30 billion you might be putting that head to head to a product that has 60 billion and you may actually get better results with it um green tea again you know are people going to drink green tea are they going to drink decaffeinated green tea because obviously caffeine could be a trigger for some people and then you know things like essential fatty acids and so you know again if we're going to say hey look here's a protocol well that's pretty good but part of that protocol is going to have to be hey how are you managing your stress what is your diet and what's going on with that diet right how is your relationships in your life right what trauma have we had in the past? Because that's a big risk factor for autoimmune conditions. Um, what infections are you dealing with? You know, again, um, I mentioned that big thick book that I had at the beginning of this, and that's that was uh, written by a guy named Yehuda Schoenfeld. He is the father of autoimmunity. He's got hundreds of papers written, and most of them are in, are infections and autoimmune conditions. <clears throat> so, I mean, I just I implore people get good at finding infections, find the Lyme issue, find the the Epstein-Barr virus issue, find that SIBO, right? Find the the fungal problem, find the issues that are driving it, right? And all of a sudden you're going to alleviate a lot of symptoms, create a lot of improvement in quality of life. The issue that I get into and that I've seen and, and learned on firsthand is that just removing the triggers is not enough for autoimmunity, right? When a hammer goes through the window, removing the hammer does not fix the window. Now, Dr. Alex Vasquez said that, okay? Pretty smart guy when it comes to autoimmunity. He was my, he was my mentor. He was a guy who basically taught the master's program that I taught. Alex is the OG. He is an OG for sure. Pulling out for him. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, but it makes sense because what I found was I needed to be using the right fatty acids. Again, that can be supplements, that can be from the diet. And then I need to be using these other compounds and therapeutic quantities so that I could wind the inflammation that that immune system has gotten stuck into. It's that vicious circle. So if you can figure out that trigger, rehab the immune system, all of a sudden, it doesn't have to be a protocol anymore. It turns into a formula that can work from patient to patient to patient. And that ain't bad. That's beautiful, man. As you take a sip after a long Vince Vaughn style monologue, Ian, that was absolutely awesome, man. I think, uh, I think not only do we do it on time perfectly, uh, we'll call it via planning rather than happy accident to make ourselves look really awesome and prepared. But you know, I want to thank you for everything. And uh, if people want to get a hold of you, because I think this conversation, you earned your cake. I don't think yeah. you should wear a unitard, but I think you've earned your cake. <laughs> well, we go, to, that's level two. That's level okay. two is the unitard. Yeah. I mean, you know, your aerodynamic wind resistance is really good in the unitard. It's just, it's a little revealing if it's, you know, a cold day in, in Boulder. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> where can people find you if they want to connect with you a little bit more? If they want, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so you know, like I'm on social media. I'm doing, and I just started TikTok the other day, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I'm on Facebook. You know, I've just started TikTok, so um, it's it's kind of funky. It's it's it's. You know, I've already got people messaging me back on TikTok. It's kind of interesting. Um, and then of course my email is uh, Dr. Ian D R I A N at Dr. D R autoimmune.com. So people can hit me up and send me an email if, if they, they need help. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to help that, that place. I, I've, I feel like I've seen such crazy and complex clients that um, I'm always willing to, to talk to people about their hard ones too. And if, if that helps them, then, I mean, honestly, we're here to help people. And, uh, and that might be a, just a one-on-one conversation with people, um, or it may be, hey, you know, uh, an invitation, at least, you know, try some of these products out and see if they work for you or give us feedback. I mean, there may be other stuff that, you know, should be in this that eventually we, we might want to put in there that is super cool. So hopefully people can get a hold of me those ways. Yeah. And, you know, it may be the last thing to ask is, you know, if there are any young clinicians or people who are wanting to uplevel themselves in terms of the scope or the success of their practice, what's the one piece of advice you have for people kind of like looking up at you going, wow, he's really dialed into not only what he's good at, what he loves to do and he's successful at. What, what piece of advice would you uh, impart to them? Uh, I would say, uh, check your ego and work hard. Uh, find, find the people that you identify with that have the knowledge base. 
and figure out how they got their knowledge base, go get it, and then apply that. And if you can just keep that wheel spinning, you're going to get better and better. And, and again, people are going to then feel that power of attraction coming off of you because you are hopefully walking your talk, right? You're living it. Mm -hmm. um, you're not just that person, right? Who says, Hey, look, you know, be gluten-free and then go eat gluten because, you know, we call those people hypocrites. If you do have an issue with that. Right. So I think check your ego, keep it focused on the patient and then keep the knowledge quest going. And if, and if you can just recycle that piece, I mean, there's so many people out there that's sick that, that will be happy to work with you. Man, wow. Friend. Thank you for being the, the first master supplements masterclass interview. This was really awesome. I uh, thank you for your time, my friend. Hope you enjoyed it. Hey man, it was awesome. And it went by super, super quick. It did feel like five minutes or 10 minutes, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you both. You're welcome, Jeff. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. And for everyone who attended, thank you as well. Till next time. We'll see you guys next month. We're doing the uh, next week is the gut endocrine axis webinar that's still on the go for all the practitioners. And we will be back uh, next month with another masterclass. So please tell all your friends and colleagues. Thank you very much. Bye.